Please turn with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14, our text this morning. Acts chapter 14, in a moment we will read verses 19 through 28. You know, as a pastor, I have the privilege of meeting a lot of other pastors. And I also get to meet a lot of missionaries. Uh, aspiring missionaries and aspiring church planters. And one question that always comes up as I meet those who are uh, trying to gain support for church planting or, or missions, one question that always comes up is, why do you want to do this? Why do you want to commit your life to being a church planter or to go overseas as a missionary? What is your motivation? And there's a lot of different responses that I've received over the years from that question. And some are really good answers, and there's some that are not good answers. And one particular guy from many years ago, um, my conversation with him uh, sticks in my mind. I'll never forget it, because he wanted to plant a church because he hated his current job. He was making very low wages, working at a restaurant, and he hated it. And he felt like he was wasting his life away, and he was tired of doing what he called a meaningless job, working in a restaurant. So he felt that the best thing for him to do, to do something big for God, to do something meaningful for God, was to quit his job and to plant a church. So basically, he felt like it was impossible for him to do anything big for the Lord with a basic, ordinary job. So he had to come up with some plan to do something radical. Now, in his response, he didn't say anything about reaching the lost. didn't say anything about the gospel need in the area that he wanted to plant a church. He didn't say anything about the Lord leading him or nudging him to do this. He didn't say anything about a desire to exalt the name of Christ. He just wanted to get out of his current situation and do what he thought was big for the Lord. The problem with him was that his impulse was right. We want to do big stuff for the Lord. We want to um, expect great things and do great things and all of that kind of stuff as we serve the Lord. Um, We should desire those things. But he had convinced himself that he could not do anything meaningful with a normal job. That's an error right there. That's a problem. By the way, as a side note, the perfect job does not exist. If the perfect job exists, I have it already. You're supposed to say, oh, thank you, Pastor. We're We're glad that you're here, too. That's what's going on there. So, uh, there's no perfect job. If you are discontent until you find the perfect job, then guess what? You will always be discontent. Now, what this brother should have done was to uh, seek to faithfully serve the Lord through his current job. He should have opened his eyes to all the opportunities around him, to all the other people that worked in that restaurant, to all the... uh, people that came in as customers to that restaurant and opened his eyes to all the opportunities that were presented before him to serve the Lord, to make known the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are people that work in restaurants that I'll never have a chance to share the gospel with. But if some of you or one of you or this guy works there as a follower of Christ, then there's a gospel witness working side by side with lost people each and every day. He should have looked for those opportunities. He should have cooked the food or whatever it was that he did to the glory of God and not seen it as a meaningless job. If he did that, then he would have found out that he could have done something big for God even as a restaurant worker. Listen, most of the Christian life is lived out in ordinary circumstances. So if you're looking to do something big for God, then you should start by being faithful to Him in all the little things in your life. If you are a husband, then love your wife well 
to the glory of God. Amen? Right? If you have children, then raise them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. If you have a job, praise the Lord, work to the glory of God no matter what your job is. If you just have friends, then be a good friend and point your friends to the glory of Christ in your relationship. And whatever job that you do have, work heartily as unto the Lord. So to do something extraordinary for God, all you really need to do is to strive to do the ordinary really well. Now, as we keep marching through the book of Acts, we're seeing and reading about these extraordinary things that happen uh, through the apostles and through the through those uh, Paul and others, his companions and all of that. We have to remember that these extraordinary things that happen, even through Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, they don't just happen out of the blue. Paul is not just like sleepwalking through life and then all of a sudden heals a person and does some miraculous thing. Paul um, is excelling in all the ordinary things and then just happens to be used by God for some extraordinary thing. And he would not be used by God for the extraordinary thing if he wasn't doing all the ordinary things well. Does that make sense? You tracking with me? Um, so, if we're going to do extraordinary things for God and do big things for God, then there's a million ordinary things, maybe not quite a million, but a bunch, thousands of ordinary things that we have to be doing well to be prepared to be used by God in that way. Now, before we read our text, I know this is a little bit longer of an introduction, but before we read our text, let's do a little bit of background review because we're picking up kind of in the middle of the chapter. Now, Paul is on his first missionary journey. We read about this first missionary journey in Acts 13 and, and 14. At this point, he's already traveled tons of miles. I mean, he has worn out his sandals, for sure. Like, he has traveled a lot. And he's faced a lot of opposition, and he's had a lot of success. People are getting saved. The gospel's going forth. People are believing, uh, being born again, and being baptized, and and being added to the church. The church is growing. Now, on this particular leg of this first trip, he went first to Antioch of Pisidia. Okay, Paul proclaimed the resurrection there, and the people stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and they drove them out of the district. He faced serious opposition. And Luke tells us when they left the city, they shook, shook the dust off their feet. <clears throat> And then Paul and Barnabas traveled to Iconium. In Iconium, many Jews and Greeks believed, but some unbelieving Jews poisoned the minds of the people against the brothers. So there was a plot that developed from this to mistreat and stone Paul and Barnabas. So they fled uh, from Iconium to Lystra and Derbe. In Lystra, we read about this last week, Paul um, healed a man lame from birth. And the people of the city saw this amazing miracle, and they decided that Paul was, was not an ordinary man. This was a pluralistic society. They believed in many gods. So they just assumed that Paul was a god that had come down, and, and they, told, they, they, they decided that Paul was Hermes because he was the chief speaker, and they called Barnabas Zeus and just assumed that they were gods who had come down in human form. And then they tried to make sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas and worship them. Now, Paul is repulsed by this. He says, I too am a man. And then he described to them the one true God. There is only one God, the living God, Paul describes. Their pantheon of gods and all these different gods, many of them made of, of wood and stone, they're nothing. Paul calls them worthless things. They are vanity. They are nothing. They're empty in themselves. He says, turn from that and turn to the true living God, the one true creator God. To believe upon his name is to turn away from all others and worship him alone. So we pick up, this is the scene. These people are trying to worship Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas preach to them the true God. And then uh, scarcely, even with those words, scarcely prevented them from worshiping them and offering sacrifices. And then we're going to pick up in verse 19 of chapter 14. Luke writes, But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, 
supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. And from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived, and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the faithfulness of Paul and the way that you used him to move the gospel across the world to the ends of the earth. Father, I pray that we would walk humbly through this text and that you would have us to see what you'd have us to see. Father, I pray that every word that's spoken uh, will, will be um, faithful to your word and will bring you glory. We love you. We need you now. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. So our text begins this morning with unbelieving Jews coming from Antioch and Iconium. So unbelieving Jews are coming from cities that Paul had previously preached at. They weren't content with him just leaving the city. They followed after him. Um, and they wanted to hunt him down and stop him from, pro from proclaiming the truth of the gospel. So they come to um, Lystra, and they persuaded the crowds against Paul. Now imagine this scene. You know, we are not told exactly how much time transpires between all of these events, but Luke reports it pretty rapidly. At one moment, the people are ready to offer a sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas, claiming them to be God, Hermes, and 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 Zeus. By the way, the Latin. You know what the Latin translation of Zeus is? Jupiter. It's where we live. So, well, I don't live here anymore. I live. So, so that's on y'all. Y'all are accountable for that. But, um, nonetheless, um, they're ready to offer sacrifices to these guys. They're thinking that they are gods. And then these unbelieving Jews come and stir up the crowds and persuade the crowds. And now they pick up stones and stone Paul and, and, and think he's dead and drag him out of the city. Here's at least what we should take away from that. The crowd, it just it, it almost doesn't matter what crowd it is. The crowds will always be fickle. You know, we live in a day and age where people wake up in the morning and see how many subscribers they gained overnight. You know, how many followers do I have? How many friends do I have? And all of that. And so many young people are growing up clamoring for people to like them and share their stuff and to subscribe to their stuff and all of that. I promise you the crowds are fickle. And it, it is, you have to guard your heart to make sure you're not chasing after the applause of the crowd because they will turn on you. Um, and that's what happened here. Um, and, and, and neither option was a good option. Paul wanted them to believe upon the name of Christ and worship him exclusively, and none of those options are picked by the crowd. So they turn on him uh, on a dime, pick up stones, throw them at him, and they drug his lifeless body outside of the city, assuming that he was dead. And then Luke tells us, just matter-of-factly, just very quickly, a group of disciples gathered around him. Now, we are not told where these disciples came from. Were these new disciples in Lystra? Were they disciples traveling with Paul? Were their disciples already in the city? We are not sure where they come from, but they gather around Paul, and we don't know what they do around Paul. Maybe they just looked at him and said, I don't know, what should we do? Is he dead or not? How do we find out? More than likely, they were praying for Paul, don't you think? And then Luke just tells us Paul just got up and went back into the city. Um, Paul is close enough to death that the people of Lystra assume that he's dead, but then he just gets up 
he walks back into the city, and then Luke tells us the next day, Paul and Barnabas travel to Derby, which was 60 miles away. Probably, I don't know, a three, three-day trip or something like that. For, for them. Paul was relentless. He was relentless. He had an unparalleled resolve to continue preaching the gospel. If you're looking for big things, this is it. This is an extraordinary way that God used Paul. It took extraordinary courage. By all accounts, this was big. This was a big thing to do for God. This was meaningful. And Jesus said himself, Blessed are you, blessed are those when, who are persecuted. Paul was doubly blessed. because He was persecuted greatly. And it doesn't mean that it was pleasant for Paul. I mean, they picked up rocks and threw at him to the point where they thought he was dead. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound very pleasant. Uh, several, uh, several days ago, a couple of months ago, when we were beginning this house renovation, we went to Home Depot and bought some cabinets. And I was taking a cabinet down off of the second shelf, which was dumb. You know, you learn these things along the way. And they're front heavy because all the weight is in the front where the door is. And that cabinet came down like, like, like fire from heaven. And it fell right on my toe. And this was, this was 60 or 70 days ago. And I, I, uh, I barely walked out of the store. It was awful. And then I came to church the next day and pretend to not walk with a limp to deceive you all. So the, just kidding, but um, my toe is not is not perfect even now. It won't bend all the way. That's why I can't run. If anybody ever wants me to run a 5K, I can't do it because my toe doesn't work. That's just one little, my little toe, just my toe. Now imagine being pelted with stones and all the contusions and bruises and uh, concussion and all of this stuff. And I just, I just, I, we don't ever see... Jesus or the apostles healing themselves. I don't think Paul just, I don't think they prayed and Paul just jumped up like the lame man jumped up like a deer when he got healed. I don't think that's what happened to Paul. I think Paul slowly got up. I think he was bleeding all over the place. I think he had a, I think he was concussed. And I think that he had bruises all over him. And I think that he got up and they helped him limp back into the city. I think Paul was really tough. So yeah, he did something big for God. But I think when Paul later in his life would write things like, our outer self is wasting away and our inner self is being renewed day by day, I think he meant that. I think that Paul, by the time he got to the end of his life, when he's writing Second Timothy, I think Paul had scars all over his body. I think Paul was beaten up all over the place. I think he had spent his life for the glory of God and it left him a, a shriveled up man that his body was failing. Now, as we think about Paul, the, the point I want to make is this. We should admire his courage and his conviction and his boldness and his commitment to the Great Commission. And we should want to see more and more missionaries and church planners and pastors raised up and, and ha have a willingness to go and do hard things. We want to have that here at our church. We want some of you young people as the Lord leads for, for God to send you to the hard places and we'll support you for your whole ministry. Like we want all of those things to happen. But I think Paul would tell us if he was here this morning to not look for some far off extraordinary thing that you might do for God 10, 15 years from now. I think Paul would tell you to excel in doing all the ordinary things in our daily lives that we do for the Lord Jesus Christ. I think too often we have a youth camp mentality about the way that we serve Christ. I remember going to youth camp just a few years ago. That was a joke too. Like when I was a teenager, you'd go to youth camp and you'd have this big emotional experience, right? And the Lord worked through that. But I would come back, I remember I would come back and then growing up where I grew up in the South, I would come back and I'd tuck my shirt in. That was just a little hint to everyone that I'm different. I know that sounds weird, 
But in the churches I grew up in, if you tucked in your shirt and you buttoned it up all the way, then you you were that was a sign of maturity. The way you look, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Some of that. Um, and I would carry my Bible with me. I didn't really read it, but I carried it with me just so everyone would know how godly I am. And then you know what would happen? The youth camp high would come down, and then three months later, I was doing all the wretched things that I had been doing. Youth camp is great. Uh, mountaintop experiences are great. But if they don't produce lasting change in our lives, then they're pointless. I feel like these grand, big emotional experiences that everyone chases, sometimes they're like a like a balloon. You ever blow up a balloon with your kids and you get it real big and then you let go of it? And there's all this activity. It blows all over the place. It makes all this noise and the kids laugh. It's this great moment. And then what you have left over after it settles down is a little balloon, stretched out balloon with slobber all over it. With no strength and no purpose. That's kind of what the big emotional experiences can do to us. What's better is to grow like an oak tree. You know how an oak tree grows? Slow, steady. And the years go by, and it gets stronger, and it gets stronger. And the winds come, and the winds blow, and it won't knock it down. That's the way we want to grow, slow and steady. Slow growth is good growth in our lives. Um, the Christian life is one that is meant to be lived out slow and steady. And it's, 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 it's oftentimes very mundane. It's daily repenting of sin. It's daily turning to God. It's picking up our Bibles and reading our Bibles. It's daily striving to think less of ourselves and more of others. It's being disciplined together with the saints and seeing with joy in our hearts to God and to one another, together, together, as the saints of God, to encourage each other, to exhort one another, to press on towards love and good work. And we place ourselves under the preaching and teaching of God's word. And we do all of those things, not because the people are wonderful, because oftentimes we're, we're not. We're a mess, and we need each other to love us in the mess. We need to forgive one another and bear long with one another. It's not because we love every single song that we sing. It's not because we love the tune or the melody or the tempo of every song that we sing. As if, as if it's about your preferences. That's not what it's about. Nor is it about whether you like the preacher's jokes that day, because obviously you don't. Or whether you like the preacher's style or this preacher's style, or I like this or I like that. We do these things throughout our lives as Christians, because God in his word has told us to do these ordinary things. And that's how God grows us, slow like an oak tree, is by us doing the simple, ordinary things over and over and over again. Not looking for frills and thrills. Not looking for the hairs to stand up on your arm. That's not always going to happen. Sometimes you're going to come to church and it's going to be hard. Your mind's going to be distracted. Your heart is restless. And you do the right thing. That's the long haul of the Christian life. And in my opinion, when you get your brain wrapped around that, the ordinary stuff becomes extraordinary. And, and there's, there's nothing like being with the people of God in your own local church and hearing your voices. I like, you know, we all kind of sat down a moment ago when we were supposed to stay standing, you know, but we sang with, with no music and, and we heard everyone's voices. Like those are sweet moments that we do together. And, and that may feel like no big deal, but that's a big deal. A big deal for us doing that together. All right, verse twenty-one. Paul and Barnabas went to Derby and preached the gospel there. So they leave Lystra. The next day they wake up. They go uh, make their way towards Derby. And Luke tells us that they made many disciples there. Now that word for made many disciples or made disciples is the same word used in the Great Commission in the Book of Matthew, Matthew twenty-eight, eighteen through twenty. Um. Um, this this is the heart of the Great Commission. In Matthew 28, it is the primary verb, make disciples. This is what we do. This is what the church is strive to, uh, the church 
strives to do is to make disciples. Now, in order to make disciples, the gospel must be proclaimed. That's the first step. So Paul would have established there in Derby that there is only one God. He is the creator of the universe, and he is holy, and all of humanity is accountable to him. He is the judge of the living and the dead, and all have sinned against him, Jew and Gentile alike. All of us have rebelled against our creator and stand guilty before him and are culpable before him and are um, worthy of his judgment. But God sent his only son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died as a substitute for sinners on the cross. He bore our sins in his body on the tree. And to be saved, everyone everywhere must turn away from sin and place their faith and trust in Christ alone. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. There is only one way. There is no other way but through Christ and Christ alone. But also Jesus tells us in the Great Commission that making disciples also involves baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching all that Christ commanded. So Paul must have been in Derby at least a little while in order to make disciples. He didn't just go in there and preach the gospel and blow out. Like He, he stayed there. He invested in them. And we see later that he comes back. He does follow up. So, verse 21, they return to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. Paul was committed to making disciples, so much so that he retraced his steps. Despite this terrible persecution that he endured in all of these places, he went back because he needed to follow up with those who had placed their faith in Christ. So, Paul and Barnabas sent out uh, originally from the church in Antioch of Syria. Um, and, and then they went on this long missionary journey, and now they had kind of circled around, and they were in this city, Derby. I, mean, I can't remember exactly how far Derby is from Antioch of Syria, but it would have been much shorter for Paul to just go from Derby back to Antioch of Syria. Okay, he could, they could have walked there on foot. But he doesn't do that. He goes in the opposite direction and goes back through the city because he wants to do follow-up with all of these disciples that had been made. And then Luke lists out this follow-up plan that Paul did. First, he wanted to strengthen the souls of the disciples. How do you do that? Well, surely this involved further teaching and admonition. This involved discipleship. This was shepherding and pastoral care. Second, he encouraged them to continue in the faith or to persevere in the faith. He wanted them to keep believing the gospel. Don't turn to anything else. Keep your focus on the gospel. Don't get tired of the gospel. Don't move on from the gospel. If you go deeper in theology, go deeper in the gospel. That's what Paul was striving to do here. Third, he was saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Now, I think that what Paul was essentially saying here is that for the born-again Christian, there is trouble awaiting each and every one of us from here to the time we go home to be with the Lord. That's what he said. That's what the Bible says. There's trouble. Now, that blows apart the prosperity gospel, doesn't it? You need to turn that garbage off to your TV if it ever comes on. You ain't have it. Because it's lies. The Bible does not promise us uh, perfect health and wealth and prosperity. The Bible promise us, promises us that there will be tribulation. So we should not be surprised. Peter says, don't be surprised when the fiery trial comes upon you as if something strange were happening to you. And yet we do that every time, don't we? What? 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 Something bad's happening to me. We're all that way. I'm that way. Listen, if you are a follower of Christ, if the Spirit of God resides within you, Christ is your Lord. When the difficult things come to your life, it is not the absence of God working as if he forgot about you. When the difficult things come, it is the presence of God working in your life. 
It is the means that he uses to increase your faith and to teach you about who he is. And you can be sure, no matter what happens and how many tribulations or hardships or difficulties you face and what how severe they are or what they are, you can be sure that in all things he is working uh, them all together for good. For all those who love God and are called according to his purposes, he is working it out for our good. We are learning to trust him in the midst of difficulty and he's refining our faith through it all. And we know for certain that no matter what we face, we are in his grip every step of the way. And he's working out his purposes in our lives. And we also know that nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ. Not even tribulation. So fourth, they appointed elders in every church. The plan for the church was not for the apostles to be venerated and, and, and to, to be the rulers forever. That was not the plan. The plan was for them to uh, make disciples as the foundational office of the church and then establish elders in every church. Now notice a few things. First of all, it's plural elders in every singular church. Okay, We believe strongly in a plurality of elders. There should be more than one pastor in every church. Whether we should strive to have more than one pastor in every church. Uh, but the long term plan was for men to be raised up indigenous elders from these local churches. Not just missionaries coming from the outside, but people who live there from there being raised up to serve there. Um, and these elders would have the ongoing responsibility of shepherding and overseeing the local church over the long haul. So they would continue the work that Paul began. Strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and teaching them that uh, we have to enter the kingdom of God through many tribulations. So Luke tells us they fasted and they prayed over these le leaders and they committed them to the Lord. And then verses 24 through 28, Paul and Barnabas are making their way back to the church that sent them on their journey. So they travel back through the, the whole route uh, that they went. And then they sailed back to Antioch of Syria. And Luke says this is the place where they had been commended by the grace of God for the work that they fulfilled. So we read at the beginning of chapter 13, we read about Paul and Barnabas being sent out for this missionary task. They were sent out by the Holy Spirit. And Luke says both. They were sent out by the Holy Spirit and sent out by the church. And what that indicates to me is that the Spirit works through the church. The church sends missionaries. The church plants churches, and the Holy Spirit is working through the church, okay? So there's there's no category in the Bible for rogue people that are trying to plant churches or be missionaries apart from the local church. It is through the local church that God fulfills the Great Commission. So we have a responsibility, all of us, not just me, all of us have a responsibility to raise up those who would be missionaries, those who would be future pastors and elders, and all of that. Uh, and the church affirms these things and sins, and the church supports those we sin. So, this is the pattern that we see laid down in the church in Antioch. So Paul and Barnabas return to the church that sent them, and they give a report of all that the Lord had done through them. Can you imagine the celebration of that, that church service? They gathered the whole church together, reported them all that had happened. I'm sure that was a glorious time. And part of their report included Paul saying, uh, describing to them how God opened a door of faith for the Gentiles. Now that little bit of information is important as we get into chapter 15 where we start to think about the Jerusalem council and some of the opposition that they faced and the difficulty of uh, the church now being Jew and Gentile. We'll talk about that in a very few minutes. Now, my friend that I mentioned in the beginning who wanted to plant a church, he never planted a church that I know of. I'm not sure what happened to him. I hope that he found contentment in whatever job or occupation that he had. I don't know. But I think it's a cautionary tale, especially as we read about these amazing missionary journeys that are filled with miracles and mass conversions and and, 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 and persecutions and all of these 
these big things that we can do from God. If we start to feel like we need to chase after these feelings, the big and dangerous, meaningful feelings that come from doing these things, then we might have the wrong motivation. Most times as Christians, we simply have to commit ourselves to doing the next right thing, even if it doesn't come with a mountaintop experience. Sometimes the next right thing is a really hard thing, and we have to do it. Oftentimes, it involves going through some tribulation. And almost always, it involves a whole lot of ordinary. A whole lot of ordinary. What I have learned over the years is that doing big things for the Lord is fantastic. And it, a lot of times they come out of nowhere. And what, what it, however you qualify what is a big thing for the Lord. And the Lord uses you in some big way. It's just, it's just amazing that He shows grace to us like that. Uh, and, and I've really enjoyed going on the mission trips that I've been able to go on, the short-term mission. I love that we have planes, and uh, we don't have to walk everywhere like Paul. Um, I'm excited to go to Colombia in a few weeks, and then a few weeks after that to go to Nicaragua. But I'll never forget my very first mission trip. In 2010, first mission trip, I had some wrong ideas in my mind. I, I thought, you know, I'm taking this big risk, doing this big trip, doing this big thing for God. And in my mind, I thought that just because I was doing that, jumping out in this big thing, that somehow I was going to receive some sort of super spiritual strength, like super soldier serum or something. And like, my senses would be heightened and I would be more godly and I would be less afraid to share the gospel and I would, my sin struggles and temptations in my mind would just go away and suddenly I would yearn for God's word like never before and I would uh, pray with a, a dependent spirit like never before and then God would use me greatly and all this wonderful stuff would happen. And then I got there and guess what? I was still me. I was still me. I still had the same Pastor Paul weaknesses that I've always had. There was no extra boost of spiritual energy or anything like that. I was me. Listen, you can't just change your surroundings and expect to become a different person. You can't just step out on a limb and take a big risk for God and then all of a sudden you're different. Because change doesn't come from changing the outside. Change comes from changing the inside. And the Holy Spirit changes you from the inside. That's how change happens. And that does not happen quickly. That happens slowly, gradually, over time, like an oak tree grows. And listen, this is what I want to leave you with. You can rejoice. You can rejoice because God has promised that He will complete the work that He did. So we just got to set our face towards all the ordinary things. When the big things happen, if, if something God uses for something spectacular, we rejoice. We humble ourselves and we rejoice. We just submit ourselves to doing all the ordinary things and then we just watch Him work. And He is faithful to do that. And it's perplexing to me that He remains so committed to our growth and sanctification. It, 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 doesn't it perplex you the older you get? That He just keeps loving and serving, keeps extending grace. He keeps taking care of us. It's glorious. And what happens, what will happen, I promise you this will happen, is that you will start to see the ordinary things like just singing together like we're about to do and just praying together and just even greeting one another in the Lord. By the way, that's one of the one another's we're commanded to do. Just greet one another in the Lord. All of these ordinary things become extraordinary and they become means for great joy in our lives as we seek to follow Christ and make it. All right? So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word this morning. You are kind and generous to us. 
And we thank you so much that you extend grace to sinners like us. Father, we thank you that you have promised uh, our future. For everyone who believes, you've given eternal life. You've promised our growth. For everyone who has the Spirit of God, you promised that you will complete the work you began in us. Um, we thank you so much for that. Father, we thank you that um, that even through tribulation, you are at work in our lives. You have purpose and meaning. Even if we don't understand, we know that you are causing all things to work together for good. For us. Father, I pray for anyone in this room that has not placed their faith and trust in Christ alone. God, that by your Spirit, you would show them how desperate they are for you. That you would show them their lostness as a gift of your grace, open their eyes to their situation before you. And Father, I pray that they would turn from their sin and that they would place their faith in Christ alone and that you would cause them to be born again. Father, I pray that that will happen. We love you and we trust you in Jesus' name. Amen.